Yeah, I was just going to ask you how the hell you've been doing and what's going on in New York and what life looks like right now. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, it's a little, it's still a little bleak, you know, because it's winter and um, COVID and, you know, we're just all like more stuck in our houses than we were because it's, you know, it's so, it's so cold. Um, and, uh, um yeah kids are not in school you know so that's um um so you know that's that that's difficult um and uh yeah but it's like a um i mean when you actually do leave your house and walk around like the the mood is not bad you know yeah like like because everybody who's doing that at that moment is kind of happy yeah 100 <laughs> you know, yeah, no, no, yeah, Every, no. Any single person I've run into has just been like, hey, how, how are you? <laughs> exactly. Like you run into your neighbors. Everyone has a lot to say. Like it is yeah. kind of like a, a like like a, a like a desperate friendly time. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, that's good. Like so you're generally in good spirits then. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's really up and down because sometimes like it's. Some, I mean, sometimes it just feels like, oh, like the kids are never going to get back to school and like, you know, we're never going to see our friends again and, you know, whatever. Um, but, um, but at the same time, it just like, um, I actually got a, my first shot yesterday. Oh, right on. So Good. I actually, Congratulations. I Thank you. How the hell did um, you get a shot? <laughs> I know. Um, so I haven't been very public about that because um, I feel bad being in a category that that gets it, but um, because I know that everybody needs it. Um, but um, um, but because I am a higher ed teacher. Right. Um, so. Um, I mean, seriously, we just need the K through 12 schools open so much more. Yeah. And like, I, I just, I don't even necessarily agree with the policy that vaccinates me, but I was not going to say no. Right. <laughs> Understood. Um, so, um, but it, you know, I, it's actually really heartening when you go to get the vaccine, it's really well run all these like, you know, very, um, you know, all these very hardworking and, you know, diligent professionals are administering it and giving you really great information and um you know it's like a little glimpse of um how things could work and, you know right. <laughs> like, 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 the, like the system actually this is something our system could do yeah. like like it could vaccinate everybody like, yeah. like this is like not something that is outside of the um I don't think this is something that is outside of the um, um, capabilities of our our current society. I mean, just like I I always believed that there would be a vaccine. You know, like a lot of leftists were like, "Oh no, no, there'll never be a vaccine. We're gonna be like locked in here for ten years or whatever." Like I always believed there would be a vaccine. I think there are certain things that. Um, you know, so there are certain things that um, we as humans have gotten fairly adept in, um, at doing, like problems that we've got, gotten fairly adept at solving. And one of them actually is um, finding cures to diseases and, um, like, and, um, and finding vaccines. And, um, to, and so, so I'm not surprised that there is a vaccine. What we're not so good about is, um, is distributing um, you know, those things universally yeah. because um, that's not what capitalism does well. Right. Um, right. Um, but I do think we, we have the capabilities to do it. Yeah. And more and more people want it. My dad just got it. I was happy to see that. My mom's about to get it. Um, oh, that's cool. My yeah. parents got it too last week. It's really, it's really a relief when your parents get it. Oh. Yeah. No, big time. Um, yeah, I've been the po well on the positive side. I did hear a report the other day from NPR that there's going to be like fast acting at home tests that will be available sometime soon. So they say they're like thirty dollars a piece right now, and you can get the re results within like fifteen minutes. They think as they put more and more on the market that 
the prices will go down. So it would be, you know, to me, that's like kind of a game changer because, Huge. you know, like yeah. that could be, I don't know if like what that would look like with large events. Um, we were thinking about like here at the community center, but even like just dinner parties, you know, yeah. <laughs> just like having somebody at the fucking house just to hang out and, you know, drink some wine and have dinner would be like a game changer. <laughs> Huge. That would, that would really, um, that would really make our whole life so much better. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you've, uh, there's a couple of people that I've been keeping up with who it, I'm like in between feeling good that there's a vaccine, obviously. Like I also was worried about, there were people on the left who were like, people need to get to work, you know? And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> like, you know, talking about herd immunity, like back in like May and stuff like this. And I was like, yeah, oh yeah, God, yeah. like that was, that scared me a little bit, but um, yeah, yeah, one agree. of them has been, they're two, they're both liberal guys. Um, Dr. Michael Osterholm, who's out of university of Minnesota and um, this uh, Dr. Nicholas Christakis is his name. He, oh, yeah, yeah. I just, I read his recent book, Apollo's arrow. And he, he looks at it like what he was saying is that there's going to be like these phases and that it's just as time moves along, people will just become like, we'll have more and more openings and things will continue to slide into like what we would consider normal. Um, mm -hmm. But he, you know, he was saying like that it, it will still be some time before it's like what we remember, you know, meaning like no masks and like no social distancing or like occasional closings. And his point is, which is a good point for us, anybody who's organizing is like, there has to, both of them are making the point, which is good as like, liberals they're making this point over and over again and that is like without an international response we're screwed like everybody yeah. has to get vaccinated because if you like if the example he used was if you had everybody in europe and the united states get vaccinated or in north america but the virus was still allowed to like mutate and create new variants in other parts of the world and those variants came to the united states then we would like be in this constant cycle of trying to find booster shots that could keep up with the variants. And so their point is like, there's no other way other than an international response to this. Totally. And it's when it's one of these situations where inequality is, is really going to be um, bad for everybody. Yeah. I mean, you know, and you know, if you let the poor countries, you know, I, I just um, read an article that was from way back in May um, by Neil Singh in The Guardian, um, and um, and he was arguing exactly exactly this, exactly what you just said, um, th that um, that it was, it, and the historical parallel he made in great depth was um, with cholera, mm -hmm. which was has been solved in rich countries um for for years um but is still um killing people in the global south and um and it was funny because i felt like if i if i had read that back in may you know he he's so he's predicting in this in this article that the same thing is going to happen with the coronavirus and if i'd read that back in may and probably if i had like posted it on the social media or whatever when it came out I'm sure that everybody would be would have been would have been like, yeah, yeah, but we're not even going to solve it here. You know, you know, like like people just wouldn't have even have been ready to think about the international um, inequity issue because right. um, because we we wouldn't have believed that we were going to be okay. Right. Um, but um, but but I think um, yeah, it's definitely long since time to be thinking and talking seriously about that. that I, I think even I think even Biden is starting to talk about how they, they need to they need to give money to the poor countries to get vaccinated. Yeah. Yeah, that's been that's been encouraging. I and a yeah, lot very, of just the last like ten months just talking to folks who maybe were apolitical before this, the and to the degree that people knew that life was fucked up living under so-called normal times, um, especially in areas like this that have just really fallen apart over the last 45 years of deindustrialization and all the rest and yeah. un union busting and everything that comes with that war on drugs, et cetera, et cetera. But um, 
the veil has been lifted for a lot of people. I mean, even people I know who knew that things were screwed up, like they, I think part of that cynicism about the vaccine and I think part of the cynicism about the overall response is just watching things unfold for the last 11 months. A lot of people who thought, ah, you know, the United States is kind of screwed up, but maybe it'll handle this or we're, we're not like on par with developing nations, are we? Like that, you know, a lot of people, <clears throat> excuse me, looked at the numbers of dead and, and people sick and they go and they're going, my God, like how can, you know, Vietnam and China, and they just go through a list of countries that have dealt with this so much better than we have. And uh, I it's think it's really been a wake up call for some folks. Yeah. 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 That's, that, that, that's, that's good to hear. And I, I think, I think you're right. I mean, it really has been a, a moment where we see that our, 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 our system just doesn't, um, just doesn't function. And, and I think also the, um, the, just the, the, alar the alarming um, ascendance of Trump and of the right wing elements that he enabled. Like, I think that, that, that was also a wake up call that I don't think is going um, to, and I, I don't think the wake up call is going to recede with Trump. Like, I don't think that, you know, people are just going back to brunch. Like, I, I think that, um, I, I think that, that the fact that, um, that someone like Trump could be ascended to the presidency and, um, and you know, who brought such a, like a deep dysfunction um, to governance, you know, I mean, and, and to everything, yeah. uh, you know, um, and, um, and, and then, and, and then to have, um, you know, these, and then to have that person, you know, like incite this, um, you know, crazy uprising attempting to overturn an election that was won by 7 million votes of, you know, I mean, I, I think that that's, um, you know, I, th I, I think things like that are really um, appropriately signaling to people that there's like a deep rot in this um in this system and 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 in our society and there's a, a real um will to address it and fix it that's a perfect segue into what i wanted to really get into to talking about with you we'll start off with the negative and then we'll end with positive things <laughs> like dsa organizing and electoral victories yeah. and things like this but let's get through all of this shit so yeah, exactly. So oh much my god, there. yeah. So I felt like I've lived in an al alternate universe ever since the force to vote thing started. So when the force to vote thing started, I was like, "This is wild." Like I kind of saw it at first, and I was like, "Oh, I." To be quite honest with you, when I first saw it, I thought, "Well, for fuck's sakes, if they could get all these cats who are spending all this time online to like actually get up and do something, that's not a bad thing." And it was just like vaguely hearing about it. Then somebody sends me an email. Last words. Well, then I get an email from a friend in this goofy motherfucker, this Jimmy Dore guy, who I just learned about over the last 11, 12 months. Yeah, yeah. 10 same. months. I mean, Sergio and I, look, I don't even know. Sergio doesn't even know. It, you, I think I was at a party once with Sergio and somebody was like, hey, like, have you heard of Harry Potter or whatever? Sergio's like, no, I don't even know. Like, Sergio, oh, doesn't, like, respect. Sergio, I like, he doesn't have like a, you know, we don't have a TV upstairs. Like we don't, I, you know, Serge and Serge is even more, what would you say? He's like, I'm not in a lefty left kind of bubble thing. <laughs> But Harry Potter's not the lefty bubble. No. <laughs> Harry I Potter's not. No, no, oh, no, you no, mean no, with the Jimmy Dore, Dore stuff? And everyone else who's on this yeah, like we didn't know. Like I don't spend that much time in this online world of shit. So like I didn't realize like who these people. I'm like oh, yeah, I didn't. like Brianna Joy Gray. Okay, I learned who she was. Then I learned who Jimmy Dore was. Then I learned who like all these other people were. And I was like, oh my god, like there's there actually are a lot of people listening to and and watching some of this now. Yeah. To be fair, in the in our neck of the woods, like if I can ask one out of a thousand people and they couldn't pick Jimmy Dore or Brianna Joy Gray out of a, a lineup, they just be like, I have no idea, which is yeah. good for us um, I, to some degree. I mean, I don't mean to talk too much shit, but I was really just no, taken yeah. aback by the whole like, is this how people operate? Like telling people to go fuck themselves? Like, you know, like people like AOC, which 
why I wanted to have you on to talk about this is because I think you're going to bring a socialist feminist perspective to this that I do think has been missing. And I think like, when I don't want to speak for you, but one of the things that's pissed me off is like, here's a woman who comes from working class roots, looks like, talks like, and comes from a background that a lot of my friends come from. So even when she has said or done things that maybe I haven't agreed with, I just think to myself, hey, you got to cut this person so much slack who's been propelled to this pedestal now and is a national, international figure. You got every right wing lunatic. I just got a video, disturbing video from all these like Tim Pool and Trey Crowder or Crowder or something. Like all these people just like saying insanely like vicious things toward her. Mm -hmm. And then you get it from people who are supposed to be our people, or at least nominally, or just somewhere on the spectrum yeah, with us. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I've just been like, from the end, Glenn Greenwald, all these people, and I'm just like, first of all, there's a part of me, and I'll just let you speak. There, there's a, genuinely horrifying. There's a, there's a part of me and Sergio that we didn't grow up in that world, and if if it wasn't internet land, like if I saw some of these fucking people, I'd just slap them across the fucking face. Not any of the women, but I'm talking these fucking guys. Cause when I see somebody like Jimmy Dore or fucking Glenn Greenwald, I'm like, look, dude, like you would not say that shit if we were at a fucking bar somewhere. You know what I mean? Like I'd no, crack a fucking Miller Lite bottle across your head. I think that's, I, I think, that's I mean, and that's, <laughs> so I, yeah. I, no. I, I think it's actually genuinely true that the internet enables. Um, people just say these things that they wouldn't say, like, uh, you, you know, that, uh, you know, he's sitting across from you, he can see you're getting mad, you know, he'd, he'd uh, appropriately back off and check himself, you know, but on the internet, they just keep going. And it's a woman, like in the, so the thing is, is that it's a woman. And so it's wild to me with all of the unsavory characters in our political scene mm -hmm. in the United States that you're going to have this kind of venom for this young woman who's uh, Latina, who has been, like, in this shit, like, organizing, getting working class people involved with stuff, like, it, it just, it, it, I, it had such a bad taste in my mouth, and then that transitioning into whatever other nonsense has been going on has really, it, oh, yeah. yeah, so anyway, it go is, ahead. It, it is so profoundly offensive, I mean, it, that, that, I mean, as you say, with all of the, um, all of the just absolutely awful people in our government, that 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 these ostensible leftists would be focusing on um, on on this woman who um, who attracts so much hate from the right, and the reason that she attracts so much hate from the right is 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 threefold: that she's a woman and she's a person of color. And she is a tribune of the working class. There are other women, uh, you know, in Congress, and there are other people of color in Congress, and they don't um, draw quite the same intensity of hatred because they are not socialists. Um, you know, I mean, and um, and the um, and it's true that um, Nancy Pelosi gets a lot of hatred, but I would argue that is because of a fantasy that she is a socialist. <laughs> so that's that's right. a whole other right. um, like alternate reality, but I think one that has to be kept in mind. Yeah. Um, but um, but 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 AOC is you know she's she 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 she's open about it, and she is and, and she is on the floor of the house grilling these you know men of industry you know um making them squirm you know grilling these republican men um and you know these like she's she she is you know whatever your dissatisfactions about how, why she as an individual has not been able to deliver the goods to you personally <laughs> you know like where is my two thousand dollar check where is my medicare for all i get it but there's a lot of um like like she can't do that um, as a like she can't deliver the goods to you personally um but she is certainly out there sticking it um to the ruling class and um and um and that is um, why the far right hate her um, this much, and the um, and and the uh, and and for the left, I mean, I think it's um, 
I, I think that it's, I think that it's really strange the vitriol toward her. I mean, and I and I always think that um, you know, misogyny is kind of a a limited and like you know often like not that interesting an explanation for things. But it's in this case, I, you know, I have to say I, I do think that for someone like Jimmy Dore and a lot of his um internet fanboys, that is certainly part of what's going on. Um, I think there's also a um, a, a, a real um, um, I, I think I think there's also a real lack of information as to um, you know how Congress functions like you know how does a bill become a law <laughs> you know <laughs> the old cartoon yeah that's what I'm thinking about Schoolhouse Rock yes that's <laughs> I mean, you know, oh shit. Um I mean I think that like like there's a real like um I mean if, I think for some people the internet has broken their brains like and a lot um and at the risk <laughs> of sounding like a um a like a school teacher uh, which I guess I am um the uh, I mean a lot could be remedied by reading a daily newspaper. Yeah. You, you know I mean I think that for some in, like you know we we sort of there's a lot of hand wringing about misinformation um, and, you know, uh, and, and the right, the growth of the right. And, um, you know, but I think that, um, you know, misinformation or just like lack of information um, afflicts the left as well. That's a great, great point. Um, it's something that I've been talking oh, about. Oh, by the way, I do think the misinformation and the rise of the right is worthy of hand wringing. I didn't mean to dismiss that. No. But I just meant to say, like, we can't be too much on our high horse because we've certainly got a lot of very uninformed people on our side as well. Yeah. And as someone, like, I know you're, like, also actively interested and engaged with, like, you know, activist organizing efforts and so on. So it's like we have an interest in, like, making a difference. We can make virtually no difference on the far right we might yeah. be able to make a difference among some of our comrades and friends who Absolutely. are looking at this and you know processing yeah. this but something i've been talking to the last few guests about and now you bring it up is what i think to some degree has been a failure of the alternative independent media outlets so i feel like we've swung way too much to the other side where like, and now it's almost like this neoliberalization of, of alternative media where everybody's now their own little media yes. outlet where like, it's like, yes. no, like we're the, I mean, we purposely named this thing park media to go after the uh, community center name, but like also because our hope is that we can like build it out and like get people involved and like bring other people in. And it's not like the fucking Vince and Sergio show. Like, Right. The point right. of this is to like create something that's an institution that like can serve a function in a collective manner. And I like all this, the Substack stuff and like now everybody like having their own thing is like it worries me that it's like too fragmented and we need more like solid institutions. We don't need like more fragmentation on the left. Yeah, it worries me as well. Um, and and it's and it's not. um. I mean, in a way, it's it's not it, it's not entirely the fault of individuals. I mean, it really it it does have to do with the deterioration of our media institutions, and um, and that people are um, people um, have to create these personal brands in order to um, fund their work and survive. Um, and so you know, so Substack and you know the Patreons with the you know podcasts um, become. Um, become really important but um but oh, hello cat um, the, um <laughs> <laughs> he never does that he must be like <laughs> <laughs> he knows i love cats exactly I'm a sucker for cats no, exactly like that was very <laughs> um so yeah there's a a real um um so and and uh, so so it's it's not i mean it's not people's it's not really the fault of the individual media makers um, that that's the um, dynamic. It's like the, it, this is the media ecosystem now. Um, but, um, but the effect is that um, people feel this need to create their own brand um, and, um, and, and to, you know, make a mark on their brand in this way. 
uh, with with their brand and um and and then their um that tends to take precedence over their accountability or dedication to a larger movement you know or um or um or sort of um you know transformative principle like socialism you know i mean and um and i think that that is the real problem you know that um you know, you know um it's I mean, I guess just I guess it's I mean, there have always been some versions of it of this in media, but I think that it's really intensified. Also the that that there are um there are not many um alternative magazines or newspapers, sort of like institutions that um that really support people um anymore because like with the decline of the alternative weekly um or um or like the and we don't have anything like um the underground press of the 1960s and 70s which i recently um researched and wrote a wrote a piece about um it's it, you know we don't we don't have these kinds of collective institution movement institutions um which is why this is great what you guys are trying to do with this because it, it's really needed um you, you definitely i have to admit i think of this as the vince show but that's because we know each other and here we are talking yeah, yeah. You know? Um, like, but um, but but it's 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 great it, it's great that you guys are not thinking of it in that way. Um, the um, so 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 what what happens is that these individual um, media creators need to um, need to need to um, make their own mark and create their own brand, often by doing things that are exactly doing and saying things that are exactly at odds with what the movement needs. Like instead of asking how could we get Medicare for all, it's like how are we going to distinctively stand out, you know, from all these, you know, sheeple who, you know, think AOC is good. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, or institutions and, like the NNU who actually made it Medicare for all the issue that it is today. Right, yeah. right, right, exactly. And um and indeed, like um they um they're you know making their mark by um um by um denigrating you know the few things that come close to um mass movement organizations that could push for these things yeah. you know like the um um like like the unions or like um dsa for example right yeah i mean and it's like that's um that that's the, and that's that's really not what you would do if you were trying to build a movement, but it is what you would do if you're trying to gin up a lot of outrage and get people to remember who you are. Sure, and even let's even assume that the intentions are good. So let's assume. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's just no, 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 no. I'm with you. I mean, I, I could go either way, but I'm saying that I think there's an even like more important point to some degree to make that if you just have anger, like, cause there is a strain of the left. That's like, Hey, if we just get enough, like poor and working class people engaged, like that, then we'll get what we want. I do think that like, there has to be this, this give and take between like reaching as many ordinary people as possible, but then knowing that there's going to be people out there who might have a better sense of like, hey, here's how we could move forward that would be more strategic than like, let's line everybody up and shoot them or burn things down. Because I mean, like when people say that, I'm like, hey, a lot of our friends are poor working class people. And when I ask them what we should do with Congress or Wall Street, like, I'm not going to tell you what their answers are. But like, they're not the answers that I think many of us are like, hey, let's do it. And I think we did see some of that over the, uh, uh, the protests after George Floyd's murder. Because mm -hmm. I think to some, there were a lot of like people I saw who were, I would say more kind of like professional class people who are like, oh, I'm so glad that like there's going to be protests and stuff. And then when they exploded and they were burning down uh, police precincts and all kinds of other stuff, people were like, oh, wait a minute. Like, and I'm like, no, like that initial wave of people that were in the streets, those were like some of the more apolitical, not engaged with stuff yeah. type of like poor working class people that a lot of people on the left for years have been like, how do we yeah. reach this young segment of like multicultural people? Like, where are they? And it's like, 
Absolutely. there they were for like the first time that I had seen in mass numbers since I've been engaged. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I just, it was interesting to me just like in thinking about this, just this rage. So anyway, the point about door is I almost forgot where I was going with that. Um, the point about door in these type of people is let's assume that they're, they have good intentions but this is to me is the result of being having like a politics of just rage and anger without yeah. some kind of intellectual value based like principled background like so if you don't have your principles and your values laid out in a solid way as like your foundation and then some kind of like you don't have to be a college professor but like read some books every now and then you know <laughs> like i'm yeah, you know, yeah. like yeah. i don't have a college degree i read books as much as i can so i can like better understand the world like these people are yeah, yeah. smart enough to like you know sit down and read some books and stuff like I think this is a part of that too is like it worries me that a lot of people are becoming politicized through the screen because this is just like so short it's like oh I watched a YouTube video so now I understand finance or whatever yeah. it is and then you have someone like your partner Doug who it was awesome he was on Trevor's program that was so cool yeah. and yeah. You know, and it, it's like, oh, man, like, you should just re read some of this guy's stuff or listen to some of his programs, you know? And it's like, no, nah, I saw a tweet, and, like, I get it. Like, GameStop's going to take down Wall Street. And I'm like, okay, so you're angry. You're you're rightfully angry. You're seeing this thing happen. You want to see pain inflicted on these people that you see inflicting pain on you all the time. Totally understandable. But it's just not a real, uh, like, sophisticated understanding of political power strategy or how any of those things would work, you know? And then yeah. that's what worries me. Yeah. It's like people becoming politicized through that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I guess the, 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 the flip side of that is, I mean, people, um, people who, um, organize, you know, um, regularly organize field campaigns for you know dsa for example um say that um that when they get new volunteers they are very often um like jimmy door fans and, you mm -hmm. know so i mean so i i, I want to you know give people like him credit for politicizing people and i think like crystal ball same thing you know right, i mean right. I, like I, I definitely meet like people who aren't plugged in to anything on the left at all who are like oh yeah i'm like i decided i'm a socialist because i listened to crystal ball and that's amazing yeah it, that's like you know that's what you know something that um that media can do and I think then, but then we, then we also sometimes like, you know, it, it, it's, um, that, that I guess the, 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 the challenge is to encourage people to go to the next level of, you know, as you say, reading a book. You know, yeah, or, and it's like or, I don't feel or, bad yeah, saying that because getting a deeper understanding. Uh, yeah. of, uh, no, I don't think you should feel bad saying that. I think that's a really important message. <laughs> you know, read book. And I feel like I can say that. Like I am the most non-elitist motherfucker around. Like I don't have any credentials of any kind. So I just like when I tell people, I'm like, hey, like if I can do this shit, the way I look at it is like most cats who you know barely got out of high school can do it. Like, you just got to sit down and have a dictionary next to you and be like, hey, like, I'm going to read through some stuff that might be difficult at times and not quite get all of it sometimes. And, you know, I don't know. It, and I just think it's really, really important right now because there are a lot of cats that, that I meet who are operating off of pure rage. And a lot of it is righteous. Like, they have every reason in the world to be angry. And I don't ever want to be, like, tone policing poor working class people for uh, of being pissed off about stuff. But... It, it can only take you so far. Like, it's like, it'll yeah. take you this far, and then you'll also, I think, run into... I do think there's a gender dynamic to it as well. I mean, there's a lot of, like, these guys that we're meeting that are, like, fired up about this type of stuff. And I think it's reflected also to some degree, um, while even more so and in a different way, but but the, these, uh, the white power movement, you know, and this, <laughs> these... The because I, I wanted to ask you about that, so let me ask you a specific question, which is, what do you generally make of everything post January sixth? I've seen some of your commentary about you know how the left should be thinking about this, um, and I think much like the previous issue we talked about, I 
generally think the commentary has been good, but I've also been a little concerned that people have maybe downplayed the real threat that I think white power movements and far right paramilitary extremists play um, yeah. in this country. So, yeah, I just want, I wanted to see what you thought about. The, the I'm extremely thing. concerned about that. I think there's um, a real, um, I think there's a real push to on the left to, um, to minimize the um, white power movement to like, and, or, or whatever you want to call it, this far right, this grassroots far right movement um, that, um, and, um, and I think we should take it really seriously. There was a, a study that was just written about in the Atlantic um, that um, where um, they analyzed the um, arrest records for January 6th, and it showed that a lot of these people were new to the movement that's scary. It suggests that it's growing and that the people who are willing to be violent are like not even the people who have been involved for the longest. Yes. You know, that's very volatile and um, and scary, you know, um, um, and um, um, and that there um, the, a lot of them were from places that are not heavy Trump supporting places. You know, so maybe they're even more angry because they feel isolated, like they feel like everyone around them is like, you know, um, you know, participating in these liberal things like lockdowns and, you know, they don't, right. you know, but right. like, but, it, but it's not, um, it's not the, 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 the findings were not what people necessarily assume you know, that these are people who are like in their Trump bubble and, you know, just like, and, um, and, and people would have assumed that these were sort of really um, hardcore long-term right-wing activists. That does not seem to be the case. Um, and, um, um, and, and so, yeah. And I think that, um, I think that it's, I think that it's really serious. Um, I think there's, um, there's an impulse on the left to, downplay it um that seems to come from a couple different places as far as i can understand um one is um that um people seem very greatly concerned that um that um you know when we get this outbreak kind of outbreak of anti-government terrorism there's usually a crackdown you know, from the government and, you know, that um, that endangers a lot of people's civil liberties. And um, of course, that's bad. So um, the, I, the, the, the strange thing about the obsession with this on the left is that um, is that all of our progressive like leaders like in Congress um, have been opposing those kinds of measures, you know, to um, expand the surveillance um, powers of the state. Um, all of the, you know, um, I get a petition from Rashida Tlaib on this, uh, um, to this effect, like almost every day, um, you know, I mean, which is good, yeah. you know, that's good that the squad is standing up to that and saying, no, you know, we have all the enforcement powers already that we need. We don't need to expand into things that violate people's rights still further but we still need to get these people yeah. i mean that's the correct position um and um and 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 they cannot get away with it that is also the correct position like you know if you send the message that it is okay to um storm the capital and try to overthrow a democratic election I mean, no functioning government on earth would do that. Like, that's just like a, um, I mean, a, and it would be crazy. It would be, it would be crazy to, to, to just like let it go and move on. But there is sort of a weird, I mean, the, the cries to move on are not only coming from Ted Cruz. Like there is like a, I mean, there, 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 there are a lot of people on the left that seem to, um, um, that seem to want to dismiss this also. Um, I think so. So, uh, so I think some of it is the sort of um, um, this this sort of difficulty balancing a concern about government overreach um, uh, um, with legitimate, you know, um, concern about the white supremacists, and, and and I guess I think some of that comes from a little bit of um, uh, uh, like I think a a lot of the left has kind of a 
like a childishly anarchistic um, view of the state, you know, that like that, you know, that it's just, you know, it, it's just there to be oppressive, you know, um, and, you know, and that we just shouldn't ever give it, you know, we shouldn't ever um, concede anything to it um, or try to protect it, you know, I mean, like in this case. Let alone like, wield it as a tool of power. Exactly. In this case, like it's appropriate to wield the state as a tool of power and it's appropriate to um, for the state to take steps to protect its basic um, democratic functions. You know, I mean, like the, there's, I mean, I find it, I'm pretty happy that the FBI is going after these people with some competency, you know, um, and, um, and so, um, so, so I think, I think that's some of it. I think it's, but I think there's also sort of a, like an incoherent idea that white supremacy is a liberal issue and not a left issue. Um, you know, like that, that, that it's, it's, that there's sort of a, um, um, that it's, yeah, that, that, and that, that it's a distraction, um, you know, from the things that the left cares about, which are, you know, bread and butter material issues. I think that's also, um, a real serious error. Um, I mean, that, um, I think that, um, that these people, um, their consciousness is, um, at a very deep level, organized around um, opposition to socialism and to everything that we would want. Um, and, um, and, you know, if, if anything, that might be an even more consistent part of their ideology than racism or misogyny, although those things are extremely important too, you know? Um, and, um, and, and I, and I think it's, um, you know, if, if Bernie Sanders had won the presidency, we would certainly be seeing um, this far right violence against his government too, um, and a Bernie a Bernie presidency would have to, you know, put you know would have to arrest these people and deliver some consequences as well. We would have a serious we would have a serious counter revolution, and yeah. so if we the left ever want to be serious about um, about holding state power, we have to develop a kind of um a grown-up perspective on fascist violence like it's not to be tolerated it is serious and it is not a distraction no there's a, and there's a whole uh, there's a whole series of uh, uh what would you call them yeah well not not even no i was of course i'm thinking of the 1990s and and i'm thinking of kathleen Ballou's book uh book uh bring the war oh, yeah. home i mean i think yeah. she's she's like one of my favorites right now because she's just like yeah. she's spot on in that book i've been re-referencing -re it going back to it re-referencing it um there's so much to say about what you said because we because we haven't cracked down on them as she points out in her book and as others have noted yeah. that's what's allowed this situation to persist yeah. like because we haven't done this so there's like that's yeah. like the very pragmatic like right now sort of non-ideological like if you do not want to feel fearful in your country that there might be like white supremacist terrorism or whatever you want to call it far-right terrorism yeah. um yeah. you know it, it makes sense to to crack down and to hold people accountable and no you don't have to extend our laws or anything to do that like they no, all they would... exist there's too many as it as it is now but like we have the mechanisms to do this and every single um a source in law enforcement who has ever interviewed on this subject always says the same thing, which is um, the problem is it isn't enough of a priority. Yep. Like you know, that, like that that the that, that that the government needs to make it um, a higher priority um, because they're um, they're they're always. They always, yeah. Every every they always say the same thing that um that that the problem is that the enforcements of law of law the institutions of law enforcement um are always focused on this alleged left wing violence um and um when actually um a much you know bigger threat to the social fabric is the right wing violence. Well, and what was upsetting after this, the response from some of our friends on the left, it was interesting because my friends, and I th we had a, a short interaction about this, but I had sort of a lot of my uh, 
friends who wouldn't consider themselves leftists, maybe more liberal people, people who just wouldn't identify as anything, um, but generally have like liberal or progressive values. Those folks were like, oh, of course we have to crack down on them. Like, and that's what was so upsetting. I was just like, God damn it. Like sometimes like, I don't know what it is when you get too far down this rabbit hole of like, it's like, I don't know if it's like you got to step back and listen to more albums, smoke more weed. Like you got to do yeah. something. You got to get away yeah. from that world that you're in because people go so far down the hole that I'm like, wait a minute. Like and to your point, I've been joking with my anarchist friends and telling them, well, what was the first thing the anarchists did when they set up the chop Chaz zone in Seattle? Oh, they built a fucking border wall, number one. And number two, they they started to arm a security force. So they had like <laughs> a security. So they so the first two things that the anarchists did when they had their own world up in Seattle for a couple of weeks was to build a border wall and then to have an armed, you know, police force. Yeah. I, just, well, yeah. I was welcome. like, oh, no shit. <laughs> yeah, welcome to making a government, you know. <laughs> like, so, um, so I, yeah, so the point, I guess, that, that or the thing I would like to see what, you know, get your comments on is one, just like people who weren't on the left who got this intuitively, yeah. who were like, yeah, this is what we yeah. do. Because and number, it's obvious. It is uh, obvious. I, yeah, like it's obvious and sometimes the left is overthinking. I mean, I, I hate the term overthinking because, you know, I'm sure you do too, because, yeah. you know, we're intellectuals. We, we like to think a lot about things, but sometimes um, there is a, like, sometimes the left becomes an echo chamber where the, where the completely um, obvious um, common sense um, opinion gets lost. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, that's all that needs to be said about it. Um, <laughs> that's like, but the state stuff is important because I I do think that there's not enough. This this in um, Doug mentioned this as well in his commentary about the GameStop stuff. There's like this libertarian strain that goes through all of this. It's sort of this like as an individual, like I can do these things yeah. that will affect the system, and it's sort of it all you know, the anarchist stuff on top of the neoliberal culture of hyper alienation and individualization, like all of that on top of each other has created like this, you know, terrible sort of subculture of the culture of people who are like, you know, it, it, it doesn't seem to me that you, um, fuck, I forgot exactly the point I was going to make there. No, but anyway, I, mean, I think, you know, I think, you know, what I'm saying. I, I, I do. I do. I, <laughs> Sorry, I do. Jesus. No, no, I do know what you're saying, um, and I think, um, you know, I, th I think th there, I think there's a couple different dimensions to that. Actually, that um, one thing, one thing is, I, I think there's a, um, um, I, I think there, there's a, there's a tendency to look um, more at the. Um, you know more at the individual and the individual rights than to uh, and and than to think about well collectively actually what's really um, important to our our whole society um, and um, and 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 as a result you know people I, I think that it's some some of these some of these guys on the left are you know really over identifying with Trump getting banned from Twitter. Or the these guys on the right who can't you know get on parlor anymore right. you know I mean you know I mean and and I think there's like a you you know and and they they immediately go to like well you know that's gonna happen to me yeah. you know like, like and you know and you know this is just um not really about you I mean it's just it's not in the collective interest to um like to allow Trump to be on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah, like he just shouldn't like like it's it's not on the collective interest to allow like a um a, like an a, like an app on which people are plotting to kill elected officials like you know in a right wing movement like that's like you know that the, the, there's just um you know it, and and the the implications that it has for um you as an individual are far fetched but also you know, no, like, like, it's just like, not, it's just like, not everything is about that. There are, um, there, there are um, situations in which the, you know, um, the, what is at stake for the larger society is higher. Yes. Yeah, sacrificing uh, individual desires for the collective good is like 
in my opinion, like maybe number one on like the list of values we need to like hammer the fuck home with people because some of this stuff to me is so narcissistic. It's unreal. Like people just being like, I'm next. And I'm like, sometimes I look at those kind of posts and I'm like, first of all, the world might be better off if your shit got banned. Second of all, I think to myself, we might all be better. Like there's a real part. Like if you listen to what, now we can't do this because we're in a volunteer organizing situation. So we've got local regional organizing efforts and now we're kickstarting a, uh, not we, I mean the, a big we are kickstarting a DSA chapter here in Northwest Indiana. Oh, great. And we're getting like anywhere from 25 to 50 people on every call. And we've been doing like weekly workshops and calls and it's been good. So like yeah. people are getting, you know, we're, we're, we're doing the thing. And um, man, like that, that whole, I mean, first of all, that process is really important for people to do just generally. I think one yeah. of the big things right now is like, getting people in motion and doing shit in this context of the pandemic is really important just for their spirits, for their just social yeah. well-being. Um, but you know, just for the movement too, it's like, and then to get people more in that mindset of like, I'm, I'm in this with other people. It's like one of the most important things yeah. that Bernie said was just like, it's not about me. It's about us. It's not about you, just yeah. you and your family. It's about your neighbor that you don't even know. Like, Yep. We need this hammered home so, so deeply here. And I, I, I don't know if I said this, no, because it was before a lot of this other stuff happened. Now everybody's talking about self-defense and what worries me there too, even though I'm, Serge and I are not pacifist by any means, um, <laughs> but we've had people, you know, reach out and, um, you know, ask us like, can you give us def- uh, weapons training? And we're like, you know, no because I don't want to teach you just enough so you can hurt yourself or hurt someone else. <laughs> yeah, and, a little knowledge. Is yeah, like, thing. no, like a little knowledge is not good for weapons because then you know just yeah. enough to, like, do damage. And I, so I don't, I've been very, like, apprehensive with a lot of that stuff because, again, it's largely coming from men. So yeah. 99 out of 100 people who are asking me about a socialist rifle club or starting this kind of thing are men. All the women yeah. I know are like, we need child care. We need health care. Yeah. We need like after school youth programming. Like we need living wage jobs or some form of combination of like a UBI under this, in this context, like that's what they're talking about. And so I worry that a lot of what we've talked about today, it seems to have like a few sort of fundamental components. One of them is this individualism Two yeah. seems tied up with narcissism and two is there's definitely a gender dynamic to a lot of what's happening from yeah. the, from the redditors to the youtubers to the podcast like there's a whole thing happening there and i also would say that there is a maybe some kind of a class element to it as well where a lot of the people that i see maybe engaging with enough a lot of this stuff um, they're not working at like the gas stations or retail shops or like strip malls or like fast food places like a lot yeah. of those cats are not engaging with all this stuff. And so anything that's not building solidarity right now. And so anyway, to wrap, to wrap up what I'm saying, because we're facing so many challenges, it just seems to me right now, like anything in the world that doesn't build solidarity, doesn't build yeah. a sense of collectivity has to be like outright rejected or condemned because it's like, yeah. The situation is so critical and we face these forces that are like dead serious. Like what Sergio and I worry about is he, you know, we're like, look at how passionate these people are. We're like, yeah. look at the anger and like the sense of like, no, this is our country and this is what the fuck we're going to do. And if you don't like it and like, we just won a fucking election by 7 million votes and my friends are sitting at home and they're like, I don't know what to do. And I'm like, what do you fucking mean? Like there's more yeah. of us than there are of them. We just won the fucking election and we're acting like we lost and they're acting like they fucking won. Yeah. That yeah. to me is like, yeah. that has to be broken, you know? It definitely does. And that's not yeah. going to happen with it. Like people shitting all over, you know, whoever it may be, AOC or anyone else. But none of that to me is, is very useful. And I, I just think it's really important to like, you know, DSA, the victories in Georgia, um, labor unions who are organizing. I keep track of Sarah Lazar's work. Of course, I listen to, um, you know, I'm always following Jane McAlevey's work. I think she's like yeah. one of the best. Um, she makes the point the about social media, which was one of the things I was going to say is that like 
as far as getting banned is concerned, might be a good thing. I mean, to her point, yeah. she has to. We're part of volunteer organizations. That was that's what I was going to say. We're a part of volunteer organizations, so we can't like go into an organizing space and say, "Hey, you're deleting your social media." She can right. because they bring her in. You know, a union will bring her in and be like, "Hey, you're running this organizing campaign," and she's like, "Cool." Now you're all going to delete your social media applications, yeah. and it's like. Yeah. I don't think it would be the, I don't really know what to do, Liza, because on the one end, we're trying to keep the word out there and like put stuff out. But on the other end, like there's another part of us that's like, what the shelf life on this might be like a couple more years. And then like, if we're out of this pandemic stuff, we might just shut all that shit down. Put, I mean, we're already putting all of our effort into the community space and organizing when it's normal times, but it's like, might just give it a go for like a couple years and just be like, what is it compared to the like two years of organizing with this stuff? And then two years of maybe doing it without any of it, you know, just like email, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. It might be like an interesting experiment just to like kind of, and then write about it and be like, Hey, here's what our organizing yeah. efforts look like with two, yeah. two years of not using social media. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I like, I, you know, I don't know. I think that, um, um, I think that, or, or I think organizations have to get more um, disciplined about it for sure. Like you know, just to, you know, in terms of like what you're like what you're allowed to put out there, you know, like you know, and and to what extent you're, um, and to what extent you're um, allowed to um, publicly in fight with other people in the organization. Like I think there, I, I think that i think eventually people are going to like start operating with actual you know rules about that within their organization so you That's know because um because it's like it's not really workable you know to ha like to have people like just like publicly feuding all the time it's like no you know like pick up the phone that's what yeah. I found so interesting and, and being I mean shit Liza being bro I'm not gonna name any names I will when we're offline but I, I will no I'm joking um no I will really but but the uh being brought into some circles on the left for some things that I've been very grateful to meet a lot of people that I've considered my heroes and work with people whose work I've looked up to for many years you know and when I would interact with some of them and they would tell stories about this person or they don't talk to this person anymore or whatever. I'm always just oh, yeah. like, Hey y'all like, don't just pick up the phone. Do you? And they're just like, Oh no. Like I've never called them. I'm like, <laughs> like you don't just call this person that you used to know or work with. You wrote like two books with this person and you just, you, you don't call them anymore. That is yeah. so wild to me. Like very yeah. wild. Yeah, yeah, no, and I'm guilty of it myself. I mean, I like I have to admit, um, but um, but it's 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 really um, it, it's it's really not good. I mean, and it does. Um, I mean, it does. It does go back to that um, that that point you made about like that that on. Um, I mean, you know, just as in the sort of media landscape with Substack and you know the Patreons and so forth, everyone is there. Um, individual brand on social media like like everyone is kind of their their own individual brand and um and what you know what advances them and gets more retweets you know is like you know conflict you know attention um you know rage um and um and it's like it's not as um you know like the like solidarity doesn't necessarily have as much traction you know it's like it's kind of a fundamentally um neoliberal um um medium right social media which is ironic i don't i shouldn't say it's fundamentally because social media it's social yeah. right it is about sharing <laughs> you know i mean like it has it obviously has both sides to yeah. it right um but um but I think that sort of that sort of um, neoliberal fragmenting character of it, which is um, something Jody Dean has a, a a really amazing older book on this from early early days social in social media, but it holds up remarkably well called um, Blog Theory, 
um, and um, and and she, she and she she talks a lot um, ab about this, uh, you know that that how 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 um, fragmenting and depoliticizing um, the um, the this mode of communication is. And, yeah, I. I'm obviously like all of us guilty of it. Um, and I know that we're, we're coming up to an hour here, so I want, I'm going to let you, uh, go here soon, but, um, yeah, there, uh, there's still more to talk about. Well, I'll have, we'll, we'll have you back. Liza, we don't have to wait as long as we waited this time, but I, yeah, the social media stuff is, it's going to be interesting because again, I think it depends on where you live as well. So for instance, I've been trying to read up as much as I could. I know Eric Kleinenberg, did some good work on this, like in, in terms of the like sociological data and the demographic mm -hmm. data. <clears throat> but where we live, there's still a huge disconnect in terms of the amount of people who even have access to, uh, to the internet period. Uh, so, uh. so we still are in this content. And then even in like our city, which, you know, there's a tremendous amount of people living in poverty here. So it's like, there's certain neighborhoods where you might have one person in the house who has like enough, whatever on their cell phone to like use data, you know, to like use it, but they wouldn't have like a Wi-Fi at their house. Like they might go yeah. park at like a restaurant or so, you know, like somewhere where they could like yeah. use their Wi-Fi. So we're still like at this deficit areas where we live, where even the people who engage with most of my social media stuff, it's like, I don't know, maybe 80%, 75% people either I've never met or people I met through doing national anti-war stuff. It just so mm -hmm. like people who picked this up. This is through, not your local people. It's like not like if I were to like look at our community center, what would you say, Serge, of the percentage of people who come in here, how many of them would you interact with on social media? Like 10%. He says like 2%. <laughs> yeah, it's probably, yeah. it's like low. So like the people who are yeah. actually coming into our community center, like for events three, four, five days a week, I would never see any of them on social media. Um, right, right. and that's like in our area in a specific, you know, so like, I don't think that might be true if like, if you're organizing on a college campus, it would seem to me everyone on the college campus would have access to internet, would have access to social media through the university or just through their dormitory or wherever they're living, being in that right. setting, maybe depending on what university is and where it's located. But like, that's why I thought like where we live, I don't know, just be interesting as like an experiment to just kind of ditch it for a year and just be like, yeah. did it make any difference whatsoever in like the work that we're doing? And then kind of jump, yeah. jump back on and like give a report of like, here's yeah. been our year without social media. And I know that, and I know people are yeah. doing that for all number of reasons, but I think it would be good to show people that you not only can continue to organize without it, but that you may in fact be able to organize better without it. Yeah. I think you should try it. Yeah, it, it's probably probably should be a number one on our list of things to do when uh, when the pandemic ends. Yeah, when we can get people back. I mean, I'm like, I'm itching for at least to get these tests out. I would like to at least get these rapid tests so we can get some yeah. get some people here. But um, yeah. well, shit. I appreciate your time. I, I felt like I probably rambled too much this time. I should have let you talk. No, I more. probably I probably did too. Um, <laughs> I, I, yeah, for all my talk of a message discipline, I <laughs> <laughs> right on, right on. Well, it's a good to wrap with you. I'm glad. It seems like you've been writing more often. I have been. Yeah, yeah. It's um, it's really. I think that. Well, a couple things are really good. One is um. Uh, I think the conditions have been good for writing. One is um, that like I have a couple of um, ongoing uh, ongoing gigs where I just like need to produce or I won't get paid. Like and so that's good um, for writing. And then yeah. the other thing that is good, the other thing that's good for writing is um, I don't have a book I'm working on books uh, like because that's like that just really can suck up a lot of um of, of writing energy and um and at the moment i really prefer it like not having a book to write yeah. um and um and yeah so those are uh, the, the those 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 are the main reasons i think but it's good i i i like it too it's been a um one of the few um bright spots of the right last on. year so yeah no good well i thought it was awesome I, i've been seeing more and more of your pieces out there so and they've been they've been right on so i, pre I really appreciate your perspective a lot liza so thank you so much like, thank likewise you.
yeah. All right. We'll keep up the great work. Thank you. We'll uh we'll talk to you soon. Okay, great. All right, take care. You too. Hey, thank you for watching and listening. If you think this program is worth a pack of cigarettes or a cheeseburger, you can become a Patreon for as little as $3 a month. The link is available at our website, parkmedia.org. That's P-A-R-C media.org. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel below. Also, you could find us on Instagram at Park Media, Facebook at Politics, Art, Roots, Culture, and you could find me on Twitter at Vince Emanuele.